Hey guys, we're back with another episode of Jurassic Games. I know I promised this episode would be out a lot sooner, but let's just say real life things got in the way. At any rate, there's still a lot to cover with this series, and as such, we can go ahead and get started on covering today's topic, the Jurassic Park 3 tie-in games released for the Game Boy Advance. As many of you may know, the GBA was incredibly successful, and as such, it was home to a great many movie tie-in games. And considering the previous two Jurassic Park films had already gotten Game Boy games, it was only to be expected that the franchise would follow up with the Game Boy successor. In the case of Jurassic Park 3, four games were made for the GBA, three of which were published by Konami. Without further ado, we shall begin with perhaps the most well-known of the Game Boy Advance Jurassic Park games, Jurassic Park 3 Park Builder. Park Builder was released in the second half of 2001, and is one of the three games published by Konami. This is actually one of the first Jurassic Park games I ever owned, alongside the other two Konami games in this video. As the name would imply, this game is, well, a park builder. It's the very first park management sim in the series so far, which is sort of surprising since in hindsight the pairing of Jurassic Park and management sim is so natural. Normally, I'd go over the opening sequence of the game, as in previous games it set the plot of the game. But this one has no plot, so it's just some cool shots of dinosaurs. So what about the meat of the game? Well, as you might expect, the goal of this game is to run your very own Jurassic Park, make money, and prevent your dinosaurs from escaping. You build roads, paths, restaurants, decorations, gift shops, and of course enclosures. As for what goes inside of the enclosures, the game starts you off with the DNA of Compsognathus, Pteranodon, and Meganeera. You must send your dig teams out to various places around the world to find DNA of extinct animals. I say extinct animals, and not dinosaurs specifically, because, as you may have noticed with the aforementioned inclusion of Meganeura, this game allows you to find the DNA of a variety of extinct animals, ranging from the Ordovician to the Cretaceous. There's a total of 140 species in the game, though a few of them are variants of the same species. For example, male and female Velociraptors are categorized separately, and there are things such as mini Stegosaurus, giant Pteranodon, and, my personal favorite, Triceratops Elhorn. Every animal has a cool illustration in the Dinosaur Encyclopedia as well, though some look better than others. Unfortunately, when it comes to seeing the dinosaurs in the overworld, each species is shown with one of a small selection of sprites, so none of the animals really have their own unique sprite. As such, you can only really tell which species something is by clicking on it specifically. So while there are 140 animals in the game, you won't really notice this most of the time. Your animals will want their enclosures to have specific types of terrain, so you have to put them in an appropriate enclosures. For example, any plesiosaurus will want an enclosure that includes the ocean. Sadly, there is no terrain customization or decorating inside of the enclosures, so they're always pretty bare bones, and you have to build enclosures where you want the dinosaurs to go at. Of course, what is a theme park without its guests? In this game, you must attract guests not only with dinosaurs, but advertising campaigns as well. You can choose between a number of different advertising options, each with a different target audience and price. Getting guests into your park is very important, because making a profit in this game is difficult. Like, super difficult. So difficult, in fact, that I've only ever beaten it once, and that was by using a cheat code. You see, this game lets you name your park when you start up a save file, and by naming your park certain things, you will activate cheat codes. For example, if you name your park Bonus Park, you'll instantly be given the maximum amount of possible money. As you will basically be bleeding money from the moment you start, using this cheat is a, the most surefire way to win the game. To win, your park must make it through 20 in-game years without spending too much time in the red, otherwise you'll get a game over screen. The thing that makes this game particularly difficult is the hotels, because while they're seemingly crucial to continuing to make money, guests seem to hate them for some goddamn reason and will leave your park depriving you of further money. Either I'm doing something wrong or the game is glitched. 
If I am doing something wrong, please tell me, because this has bothered me for over a decade. One feature of this game I've never been able to use but seems very interesting is the multiplayer functionality. Obviously, since this is a GBA game, there's not proper multiplayer, but rather something akin to trading Pokemon. If two people have this game and a GBA link cable, there's a functionality for trading DNA you have with someone else. When you send dig teams out, they sometimes return with DNA you already have. And so if you have a friend who is missing a particular piece of DNA, you can trade that to them so they can complete a genome. I've never seen this functionality in action, but if anyone watching this has, I'd love to hear about your experience, as it's something I've always wondered about. Something I haven't touched yet is the music in this game. There's some really nice tracks in here, with the Dixite menu theme and general park music being fun and enjoyable, and I really like the sound font in general. Overall, while we've certainly gotten other and better Jurassic Park management sim games over the years, this is still one I'd recommend to any Jurassic Park fan looking for a more relaxed experience or something on the go. Next up on our list is Jurassic Park 3 The DNA Factor. And for this game, as well as the next one, I've invited my good friend Crash Fan to talk about them. So without further ado... Thanks folks for letting me on here to talk about the peak of Jurassic Park gaming. We'll begin this segment with Jurassic Park 3 The DNA Factor, developed by Konami Computer Entertainment Hawaii and released in America on July 16, 2001. Spoiler warning for this legendary game. The story begins with a mysterious cargo plane flying overhead Isla Sorna, carrying many DNA capsules, when it's suddenly struck by lightning, sending the contents flying onto Isla Sorna. player then chooses either classic character Mark Hansen or beloved icon Lori Torres to take on the duty of venturing to Isla Sorna and reclaiming the various base DNA capsules along with any DNA remnants scattered about. At the end of the game, when all the DNA has been collected, the military who was thought to have been sent to retrieve you is actually being sent to carpet bomb the hell out of Sorna. Seems like Jack Ewan wants to get rid of it once and for all. The player must make a mad dash to a leftover plane to escape the damned island, pondering whether or not dinosaurs have a place in our modern world. Truly a thought-provoking story. Now the main gameplay is structured into two different types, main platforming levels and DNA sequencing minigames. The platforming levels are your standard 2D fare, get from one side of the level to the other, but there is an added twist. Similar to Little Big Planet, there is a layer mechanic where you can go back and forth between the back layer and the front layer. This is used for differing paths in a level, or for dodging dinosaurs. An incredibly innovative mechanic for Jurassic Park and gaming alike. But also scattered throughout the levels are DNA remnants. These are very important for the other type of gameplay. There are four different color variants of DNA, and a certain minimum of each is required to access the DNA sequencing minigame. Once you have enough DNA and reach the base DNA capsule at the end, you are taken to said minigame. The DNA sequencing minigames play kind of like Breakout if you're familiar with that game, where you bounce a ball around to break tiles, except instead of tiles, it's a helix, and the balls are little DNA spheres. But instead of breaking things, you're trying to get the DNA into the proper slot to complete the genome. So not really like Breakout, I guess. Depending on how much DNA you collect in the levels determines how many spheres you have to spare. So the less you have, the less room for error there is. When the genome is complete, you successfully create a dinosaur and add it to your journal to look at, kind of like a Pokedex. All dinosaurs must be completed in order to reach the final level, where you must make an epic and daring escape against a teleporting Spinosaurus. Now for the various aspects of the DNA factor. The music itself was composed by Hans Zimmer, and it really shows in the compositions, particularly the credits theme, which got me quite emotional. There's also really funny voice clips for the characters, which surprisingly don't sound too awful considering the GBA sound chip. You also get various items to help you in the game, such as bombs to throw, a knife for attacking, or a Glock to send these dinosaurs a message. The dino variety is also pretty good. Practically every main dinosaur from the original trilogy shows up in some form, which is pretty cool to see. So in conclusion, Jurassic Park 3 The DNA Factor is the pinnacle of Jurassic Park games and perhaps even gaming as a whole. Some people may not have the knowledge or taste to truly appreciate it, 
but those who do are in for a life-changing experience. But this game is also pretty hard, and full of some cheap difficulty moments, so be prepared for an annoying time. Unless you use save states, which I totally didn't use. Anyways, falling off of that, we have the last of the Konami trilogy, this being Jurassic Park 3 Island Attack, which was released in America on November 26, 2001. This game was developed by a company known as Mobile 21. You may know them for classics such as EX Monopoly on the Game Boy Advance, only in Japan, and Gradius Galaxies. They didn't do that much. Now to the story. While flying overhead is Lasorna, Alan Grant's plane is hit by a pteranodon, which sends a crash landing on the island. Now Alan must traverse the dangerous dino-inhabited island to reach the shore, where a coast guard is waiting for him, and escape Isla Sorna. We don't really get much context for why Alan Grant is on this plane in the first place. Being a Jurassic Park 3 tie-in, it'd be safe to assume that it's supposed to mirror the events of that film, but besides the plane itself, we never see anything to support that. And if that's the case, then does that mean everyone in the plane was killed except Alan? Could this be the good timeline of Jurassic Park 3? But yeah, that's it for the story. It's quite bare, and it's just there to set things in motion for Alan to suffer another Dinosaur Island-based crisis. Now onto the gameplay. Island Attack has three main types of gameplay. The first one being an isometric style, which is the primary gameplay setting, where you can run around in eight directions, as well as jump and break things. You are also given access to your flare gun here, which lets you shoot dinosaurs, although it's pitifully ineffective. Its main usage is in shooting explosive boxes to take out the dinosaurs with. The isometric style, while looking neat, is very frustrating to play when it comes to combat. Lining up shots with your flare gun always takes a few seconds of preparation to do, which isn't very efficient when raptors are running up to you very fast and very often, slowly whittling down your health. Along with that, you'll also be bun mashing a lot to break open doors or assorted crates. I imagine this was done so that you can't just run past all the raptors and cheese the game but it's still possible if you bait the dinosaurs away. The second gameplay style is the side-scroller, which honestly makes the game a lot easier. There's no more struggling to shoot dinosaurs, although instead now you have to struggle with getting your grappling hook to hit whatever target it needs to, and the platforming is very stiff. So it's still not great, but it's better than before. The last gameplay style is an auto-scroller. It can be either Alan Grant rocking his previously unknown motorcycle skills, or paragliding down and trying not to get pecked to death by pteranodons. These levels go really fast, maybe a bit too fast, the motorcycle one in particular. Raptors drain your health just by touching you, and your attack has a pathetic hitbox that struggles to hit them, with most successful attacks usually resulting in you losing health too. There's also one-hit kill rocks that come by super fast, which makes the whole motorcycle level just really annoying. The paragliding section, on the other hand, is more enjoyable, I feel. It's mainly just reaction time based, with you having to move out of the Tarandon's way as they fly by. But this leads me to one of the biggest issues with this game, the lives system. You start the game with three lives, and that's it. You can't get more. But you can run out, and even if you game over, the game only lets you continue with one life on from that point. The only way to get three lives again is to start the game from the very beginning. And while it's not a very long game, it's still a poor design choice that makes the game annoyingly frustrating and obnoxious to play. But let's talk about the assorted stuff now. You got your basic dinosaurs here. Raptors, Compies, T-Rex, Spinosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus, and even Dilophosaurus. Raptors are the most common enemy type you encounter, with different color variants being stronger the farther into the game you get. Also an interesting note, you only encounter the Spinosaurus twice, once at the very beginning when you run away from it, and once more at the very end, where you have to do a mad dash to the shore and dodge all the incoming obstacles. Spinosaurus is pretty low key in these games, surprisingly. So there's some good dinosaur variety here. Regarding music, I found it pretty mediocre. No real song stood out to me that much, but they do fit the level at least, and I guess that motorcycle song was pretty bumpin'. And regarding graphics, they look good, but it can be muddled sometimes, mainly in the isometric levels where things can be kind of unclear. Despite all the flaws and frustrations I pointed out, it's not really a hard game. It's pretty simple actually and quite short. It's just really annoying to play. There's not a lot of really engaging gameplay to be had here, and it gets kind of repetitive pretty quickly, among the frustration. If you really want to relive the glory days of Jurassic Park games with Alan as the main character, then I guess you could give it a shot. But otherwise, I'd say it's not really worth the time, especially when the DNA factor is right there. Anyways, this has been my coverage of the Jurassic Park 3 Game Boy Advance games. At least two of them. And I'll hand it off back to Pokes now. Hope you enjoyed! Thank you Crash for covering those two games. The final game for this video will be a bit of an odd one that many people don't actually know about. Jurassic Park Institute Tour Dinosaur Rescue. 
As I mentioned in the episode regarding the Knowledge Adventure games, the Jurassic Park Institute was an education-focused program run by Universal aimed towards teaching kids about dinosaurs and science. One of the events run for this program was the Jurassic Park Institute Tour in Japan, a traveling exhibition featuring animatronics, fossils, and live shows. Footage of the tour can be found on YouTube, and I'd recommend any Jurassic fans check it out, because it's pretty interesting to look at. At these events, you could of course buy merchandise, and a unique bit of merchandise you could buy was Jurassic Park Institute Tour Dinosaur Rescue for the GBA. As this game was only available in Japan from this tour, the game isn't very well known and it can't be hard to come by, though fortunately I was able to snack a copy on eBay. The game opens with a little video of a raptor trying to break out of a cage. For some reason, it walking shakes the ground as if it were a T-Rex. I guess they just wanted the added effect. Once you get to the main menu, you're greeted with two options, Game Start and Gallery Mode. Choosing Game Start reveals what this game really is, a minigame collection. You have the choices of Cross Dinosaur, Danger Zone, Egg Guard, Rexercise, and... Take Meat? Okay then. I appreciate all of these game names being in English despite the fact the game itself is in Japanese. Cross Dinosaurs is pretty much just a Frogger clone, with you playing as a human as you try to get to a helicopter without being hit by a stampede Triceratops. Danger Zone has you play as a Parasaurolophus attempting to reach the safety of a cave while avoiding volcanic debris from an erupting volcano in the background. Egg Guard has you play as a Pteranodon scaring away humans attempting to take your eggs. Rexercise is a Simon Says game where you must copy the buttons the Rex tells you to press. And lastly, the not at all suggestively named Take Meat minigame has you play a carnivore attempting to take as much meat as you can from a pile and bringing it back to your baby's nest without being hit by a human's cannonballs. As you can likely tell, all of these games are rather simple and are basically reskinned versions of classic games like Frogger. Still, they're decent time killers. As mentioned earlier, the game also has a gallery mode. Essentially, when you get high scores in the minigames, you'll unlock images in the gallery. The gallery images are all still screenshots from Jurassic Park, The Lost World, and Jurassic Park 3. Some of the images also include sound bites of the scene the picture is from, mainly just the dinosaur's noises. As far as unlockables go, these are pretty weak, though considering this game did come out in 2001, this might have been the best way for a kid to look at stills of the movies prior to them being easily accessible online. As for the game's music, it's pretty lackluster in my opinion. The main menu theme begins like the Jurassic Park theme, which is cool, but unfortunately it changes into something new and not as good, so it's not really worth your time. Overall, Jurassic Park Institute Tour Dinosaur Rescue is nothing to write home about, as it's a minigame collection whose minigames aren't particularly interesting, and it lacks interesting bonuses. However, due to its rarity and general obscurity, I will recommend this to any Jurassic Park collector, as it's a unique and hard-to-come-by piece of media from the franchise. And that's it for the Jurassic Park games for the Game Boy Advance. Again, huge shout out to my friend Crash Fan for coming in to talk about the DNA Factor and Island Attack. The three Konami games are definitely big parts of my childhood, although I remember having a tough time beating them. If you want to know what the next episode will be about, stick around to the very end as there's a bit of a teaser. With that said, thank you all for watching this episode of Jurassic Games, and if you enjoyed it, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Your support is always appreciated. My friend Crash Fan can be found on the Godzilla Roundtable podcast, also on this channel, Fierce Features and Fossils, so be sure to check them out as well. And with all that said, I leave you with the teaser for the next episode's subject. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special announcement. A new five-star attraction has arrived in Jurassic.